So the title of my talk today is Becoming What You Smell, Adaptive Sensing in the Olfactory System. So David told me that this is a talk to theorists. So I'm going to take the liberty of talking to theorists and, and uh, therefore engaging the flights of fancy that theorists are allowed to engage in without fear that an experimentalist is going to call me out. So I want to say that in advance. So what's this talk about? Well, so, um, so I've thought a lot about sensory systems in general, about how the systems in the brain take in information from the world, process it, uh, encode it in the responses of neurons, and then perform computations that guide behavior. Amongst all the senses, in some ways, the sense that I find most intimidating is olfaction. That's because it's just intimidatingly diverse. There are many, many volatile molecules. Depending on who you ask, there are 10,000 to 100,000 molecules. And typical odors are mixtures of, I don't know, maybe 40 to 50 molecular species, like strawberry has 40 to 50 important uh, odorants in it. So if you do a naive estimate, there are sort of 10,000 to the power of 50 natural smells. That's a ridiculous number, so big that uh, Lenny Susskind's estimate of how small the number for the cosmological constant was in the sort of pre-talk talk is just sort of ridiculously uh, uh, natural in as compared to the size of this number. So, um, um, so what's more, the order environment changes. It reflects changing seasons and circumstances, new opportunities, new threats, and also context change. The same odors in the same, different odors in the same context can smell similar, you know, all kinds of in very, uh, uh, so the sense of uh, smell are kind of very plastic and changing all the time. It's also connected closely to our memory and things of this nature. So what is olfaction that allows us to do all these things? So olfaction fundamentally is a system for feeling the shapes of molecules, right? These things float around in the air and you need a little receptor to sort of feel it and decide is it this shape or this shape. So how would you do, make a system, if the brain needed a system, for feeling the shapes of molecules in the air? Well, okay, so if I think about it, I just said that there are maybe 10,000 different molecular species and an odor is, is a vector in that sense of, in that 10,000 dimensional space, uh, composed of concentrations of the different molecules. So odors are a vector in some very high dimensional odor space, call it a 10,000 dimensional space. How do you sense this? Well, you know, in um, animals uh, maintain uh, 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 a repertoire of receptors and um, Axel and Buck got the Nobel Prize for determining that every receptor is encoded by a separate gene. In fly, this order 100, maybe it's more like 60. In human, this order 300. In mouse, this order 1,000. And the African elephant has about 2,000 receptor types, right? So it's all of order a few hundred, let's say 500, give or take a factor of six, you know, on either side should cover all the animals that you know of. So what that means is that this high dimensional odor space, you know, 10,000 dimensional or maybe 100,000 dimensional, depending on who you ask, has to be encoded in a much lower dimensional response space, let's say of dimension 500, in order to encode the space of smells. So you might ask the question, how can you possibly represent such a vast odor space with so few responses? Well, so let me make an analogy. Suppose here's three dimensional space and you want to encode or represent three dimensions in one coordinate, so just let's call it X, how could you do it? Well, of course you could do this, but for example, running a space filling curve through the three dimensions and reading out the coordinate along the curve. But that is an insane way to represent three dimensions because nearby points in three dimensions will get mapped to very distant points in one dimensions. So it's going to be very in, in this one coordinate. And so it's going to be very difficult to make judgments of similarity or difference that are going to be critical for, you know, for behavior. So what you need is you need some way of encoding a very high dimensional space in a very low dimensional space while preserving a certain invariance. You'd like to preserve in some way the distances between odors because that's what you're going to use in order to be able to discriminate between odors or to tell that they are similar. So how do you do this? It's worth saying before I continue that actually when I say this, when I talk about the combinatorics of order sensing this way, I'm actually leaving out some very important things. So here is a picture of, you know, you have a, uh, 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 two odor sources. They're the same thing, colored differently, same, the same kind of smoke, one colored purple and one colored green. And if you sort of emit it at this point, and then you measure the density of the odors at different distances at some given time, 
you see that there's these sort of chaotic plumes of odors going around. As a result, if you have your nose or a sensor actually trying to sense odors, uh, you know, it's a very dynamic thing because these odor plumes coming from the source arrive at the nose stochastically. What's more, it's well known from work by, um, you know, uh, decades of work actually, uh, by Gilles Laurent and his, uh, the people around him and many others, that in addition, the sort of dynamism in order also involves the nature of the circuits. For example, there are many development rhythms and oscillations in olfactory circuits. There's theta rhythms, beta rhythms, gamma rhythms, there's a sniff cycle and stuff like this. And it appears that the timing and structure of the plumes therefore contains information about the odor source and is also critical for olfactory navigation. You know, you use olfaction not just to tell this is strawberry, that's banana, but also tell you need to go in that direction to get someplace. And you know, animals use their uh, olfaction importantly to navigate. Today, however, I'm going to be interested in the combinatorics of odor sensing rather than the dynamics. So I'll say nothing really about the dynamics, almost nothing about the dynamics. Mostly I'm going to focus on the sort of combinatorial aspect where you take this high dimensional odor space and encode it somehow combinatorially in a low dimensional response space. Okay, so we clearly have a massive constraint. This is high dimensional space, you need to put it into low dimensional space. So what have we learned from other senses about sensory processing with limited resources? So here's an example in vision. So in vision, you know, the sense that we've studied more than any other sense, the thing we've learned is that the strategy that gets used by the visual system to deal with the enormous visual space with sort of relatively few sensors and circuits is to adapt to the environment. So as you know, you know, in vision, the real world is made of objects of different kinds. There are striking regularities, like for example, the distribution of intensities in any color band has a log normal structure. There are long range correlations, which are scale invariant, so that the power spectrum is in a straight line and log log plot. There are all these kinds of regularities. So the lesson we've learned over and over the visual system is that the, in the early visual system, the fixed structure of the circuits adapts to the regularities in the environment, and then they, the synapses change, you know, during the day, if you like, to adapt to small changes in the world. And all of this is done to commit the limited resources effectively. And in vision, this has been an extraordinarily successful endeavor to use this mode of reasoning, because we understand so many things because of it. Retinal center surround contrast detectors, their spacing, their organization, edge detectors in V1, color opponency, the excess of off cells over on cells in the visual system, the visual salience of textures, the list goes on. So, you know, this has been a very good thing. However, this kind of idea of applying the idea of efficient coding or efficient computation has not actually been applied to olfaction. So we, let's try right, to see if we can use this to think about how you solve this very difficult combinatorial problem olfaction. So if we can do that, okay, let me give you, for those not all of you are olfaction experts, let me, let me remind you or tell you a little bit about what the overall circuit looks like. So here's what the early olfactory system looks like. In the world, there are odorant molecules floating about. And I'm going to think about the input space to the olfactory system as a kind of high dimensional vector consistent describing order vector uh, order mixtures. So here's a vector, maybe it's 10,000 dimensional or something. Anyway, but the color map here indicates the concentration of various species of molecules, molecules with different shapes. In stage one of the olfactory system, in the olfactory epithelium in mammals, uh, in invertebrates, uh, there are the olfactory receptor neurons. Each receptor neuron expresses one kind of receptor. And you've got many neurons that express the same kind of receptor. And they may have different kinds of binding affinities for the molecules of different kinds. We'll have more to say about that later. In the second stage of the, uh, uh, of the olfactory system, in the olfactory bulb, for example, in vertebrates, all, receptor, all of, uh, the outputs of the receptor neurons of a given type, namely ones that express the same receptor, are, collect, are collected in structures called glomeruli. So this is like a summation of your many receptors. Let's say, you've got, let's suppose you've got many of these red receptors. You collect the red receptors into one structure called the red glomerulus, and then you know, uh, sort of add the signal together in some sense. And then some processing is done, especially lateral inhibition, so that uh, to, to sort of decorrelate the signal, maybe beat down some noise. And then it appears that there are random projections, statistically random projections, from the second stage, the olfactory bulb, to the third stage, which is the olfactory cortex, the piriform cortex in mammals. And then decisions get made by the animal based upon the cortical representation of odors that's produced after passing through this pathway. 
So I'd like to think about the logic of this pathway today in terms of encoding this sort of highly combinatorial kinds of order representations. So what am I going to do? Let me summarize. I've stated that the challenge I want to think about is that there are many kinds of volatile molecules and very few receptor types in the nodes. So I'd like to know how we're able to distinguish and discriminate smells. There are many, many results that we have on this. So I'm just going to start at the beginning and keep talking. I'm not going to get to the end, and I know that. So when we get to the, so when we get to the stopping point, I'm just going to stop. And then you can ask me about any of these things in question time, if you so wish. I'm going to start at the receptor periphery, talking about compressive combinatorial sensing, about how you can use the combinatorics of order receptor binding in order to encode a high dimensional space faithfully in a low dimensional space. Then I'm going to observe that the olfactory receptor abundances actually change all the time. Your olfactory receptor neurons are dying all the time, and there's neurogenesis producing new neurons already in the olfactory epithelium. And I'm going to argue that if you believe yourself that the olfactory system is adapted to the natural world, then the abundances of the different receptor types, of the different olfactory receptor types, should be changing as you change the experience of the world. So I'm going to argue for what that should look like and then provide you with some experimental data that seems to suggest that the predictions are correct. These two first parts will be done with a very simple model of olfactory sensing, which is basically linear sensing. We're going to linearize the otherwise nonlinear sensing uh, around an operating point just to make some progress. But then I'm going to tell you, argue that it's time to get serious. You know, real receptors are definitely nonlinear in their responses to mixtures. So I'm going to, dis I'm going to do some classical biophysics in order to work out how receptors should be responding nonlinearly to mixtures of odors, uh, mixtures of odorants, and I'm going to show you data showing that the model works well. I'm then going to discuss how you might decode such a complex combinatorial code for mixtures of odors, and I'm going to argue that the algorithm that we're going to talk about which uses the power of silence, namely some receptors not responding, if you were to write it out as a neural network, it looks like the pathway in the brain. That's no proof that that's what's going on, but I'll suggest experimental tests that one could do. And then the final thing that I have to talk about, I'm sure I'm not going to get there, is that having said all of this as though the receptors encode whatever they're doing, actually olfaction is a really plastic sense. If you smell two different odors, I mean really different odors with different molecules, and you keep presenting them the same context, they'll start smelling different to you. Sorry, they'll start smelling the same to you if you, if you present them the same context. That could be just a perceptual thing deeper in the brain. But actually, there's evidence that already in the olfactory cortex, the, the actual representation of the odors converges. So you present different odors in similar contexts, and after a while, they look the same in your brain. They are the same in the brain. right? Uh, as far as you're concerned, they are the same. So how does that happen? And you know, we have results about how you might use the various circuit pathways and projections to do that. So all of this is clearly trying to build a theory of the early olfactory representation, why it's constructed the way it is, and how it changes with experience. Okay. And then uh, you know, I, I, uh, I definitely don't have time to talk about neurogenesis. I'm not even so I've graded out. Good. So that's the plan, and we'll see how far we can get. Uh, David. Um, once I get excited, I'm just going to keep rattling on. So a few minutes before the end, you should please give me a warning so that I, I can wrap up in some sensible manner. So maybe a five minute warning would be helpful. Okay. So great. So let me start at the beginning. So I'm going to start by talking about the compressive combinatorial sensing of odors. This is work done with uh, Thierry Mora, Alexander Valchak at the Ecole Normale Supérieure, Ian Hermansted, who was a former postdoc with me and is now a group leader at the Howard Hughes Medical Institute at the Janelia Research Campus, and Kamesh Krishnamurthy, a former student with me who is now a postdoc at So once again, I'm going to remind you to what we said earlier. We said that olfactory sensing has the combinatorial character of the following kind. You have a high dimensional order space, maybe 10,000 dimensional, and you wish to represent or describe this high dimensional order space with a code in which the uh, of, of, of receptor responses, uh, which are low dimensional. So you go to some 10,000 dimension, let's say to 500 dimensions, and you would like to do this, if possible, in a way that preserves distances between odors. So what leverage do you have on this problem? Right? So we said that the way you solve these kinds of problems in the brain is you use structure that's there in the world and adapt to it. So olfaction seems like something that has no structure. You know, the stuff just floats around. It could be any old molecules. You know, nothing stops a plant or animal from producing any molecules that it wants. 
But there is a structure. The structure is, suppose you're a plant or animal making some smell to throw out in the world, you're not going to make 10,000 molecules. You know, it takes a lot of effort to make 10,000 molecules in your cells. It turns out the natural amount you have is about 50 components. Right? So most foods and fragrances have about 50 components that matter. And 50 is a lot smaller than 10,000. So even though there are 10,000 possible odorants, an animal or plant that you might care about is only going to make 50 of them. So mostly, if I think about the order vector, right? if I think about the order vector like this, it's zeros everywhere, and the colors indicate places where you have some concentration of the molecule. So there's a sparsity to the input, which you could potentially leverage. To put the matter differently, although the space of odors is you know, 10,000 dimensional, actual odors occupy subspaces, hyperplanes, if you like, of lower dimension which are, let's say, k-dimensional. So in some sense, the natural olfactory space and the natural environment is a kind of union of these kinds of hyperplanes. Right? It's not actually the whole space. It's a sort of sparse, uh, there are these sparse uh, it's a union of these sparse spaces of this kind. So this maybe you can leverage. So in fact, there's a theorem in mathematics that if that is the structure of the data, you can compress it into very small spaces, into much smaller dimension, in a faithful manner, in a simple way. Imagine, for example, that you have a high dimensional vector, n dimensional, with k, and I promise you that every vector I draw is going to have k non-zero entries with k much less than n. So that's a promise I give you. So here's a statement. I can just multiply this very high dimensional vector by a random matrix a Gaussian random matrix, for example, and so long, and this matrix can be m by n, where m is much, much less than n. Right? m really has to be about k log n in size. And I can promise you that this low dimensional, represent, low dimensional dense representation output that you get from this is a faithful in the sense that every input gets mapped to a unique output. It preserves distances. So that if you compute the distances between these, let's say Euclidean distances, they're, they're preserved. And what's more, this thing's invertible. Right? Normally, if I have a rectangular matrix multiplying vector, you can't necessarily invert it. But I can promise you this is invertible. There's an algorithm for inverting it. Not clear how you would implement that algorithm in the brain, but still, there's an algorithm for inverting it. Right? So great. Well, this sounds like it was made for us. Right? So the typical order is a sparse vector in high dimensions. And so, well, so if each receptor in the nose bound to these volatile molecules with quote unquote random affinities. And I haven't defined exactly what random means. You know, the mathematical theorem, of course, random means you know, statistically random, like it's drawn from a Gaussian. But you know, it's going to be hard to make uh, receptors with random affinities too. But you know, some kind of disordered affinities or unstructured affinities. So if you do that, you'd, you'd suppose that if you, know, you have a sparsity of 50 out of 10,000, you'd probably only need a few hundred receptors about order 100, according to the theorems, the mathematical theorems, to represent all odors. And notice this number order 100 is kind of in the ballpark. A few hundred is kind of the ballpark of what real animals do. Everybody has a few hundred receptors. They could have had more, they could have had, they had less, but they have a few hundred. Okay, so with that sort of um, very, uh, uh, well, okay, so with that, with that very small suggestion of maybe that you're kind of in the right track, you know, it's on the ballpark, Let's ask, does the olfactory system use this approach? Okay. So I'm going to attack the question like this. So first of all, unfortunately, you know, this theorem applies to linear sensing. It's not nonlinear. So just to get off the ground, what we're going to do is we're going to take real nonlinear responses and linearize them. What does that mean? So here are dose response curves for this receptor in mouse responding to three different uh, molecules. Yeah, acetophenone, eugenol, coumarin, which are all three are odorants. And, you know, like any receptor, it's going to have a threshold below which it doesn't really respond. If you make the order and concentration high enough, this thing is going to saturate, you know, all the usual stuff. What am I going to do? I'm going to linearize it. So I'm going to go to this part of the slope, and I'm just going to linearize the thing and say, aha, at least in that region, this is linear sensing. That's to make, pro you know, I'm, I'm thinking like a theorist here, right? And so I just want to be able to use these theorems and calculate and stuff like that. So we can linearize, but understand the results, therefore, have validity in a certain range. So then here's our schematic of our sensing model. So here's the olfactory epithelium where you know the odorants come in and dissolve into the mucus and then they get sensed by the olfactory receptor neurons. That's these things. 
um, the signals once again of the receptor neurons carrying, you know, so let's say the red receptor are collected to the red glomeruli, that kind of thing. Uh, the outputs of these glomeruli, I didn't say much about that earlier, something's called mitral cells. Those are the output cells of the second layer, this thing called the olfactory bulb. And um, there are also in this layer things called granule cells, which are inhibitory neurons, which, you know, the, uh, the mitral cells used to inhibit each other in the classic motif of lateral inhibition that you see again in early sensory systems and randomly to the cortex. So that's the basic idea. Okay? So to get off the ground, we're going to use a real sensing matrix. This is uh, data from Hallam and Carlson at Yale um, in Drosophila. So what you're seeing here is a heat map where on the columns are different olfactory receptor neurons, right? Uh, uh, and the, uh, sorry, the, I think this is, uh, this is written backward. The, 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 the rows are different olfactory receptor neurons. They studied 25 of them. And the columns are about 100 different odors that they were able to probe. So they probed the responses of these olfactory receptor neurons, 25 of them or so, to about 100 odors. And you might say, but hey, you need to tell me about 10,000 odors, and you need to tell me about responses to mixtures of these odors. And uh, uh, you said it, uh, we need that data, but there's, it's not available very easily. So if you go across species, in most cases, these experiments are so hard to do that the data of the affinities of receptors for a wide pool of odorants is really not available. So one of the things that I hope will happen, for, uh, that will help, certainly help us theorists and I think help the field over the past, over the next few years, over the next 10 years, is sort of more complete, comprehensive databases of, uh, of, of these sort of uh, uh, receptor odorant uh, uh, binding affinity maps. So that will be very helpful for understanding olfaction as a sense. So anyway, these kinds of surveys are happening more and more, so hopefully the data will come in. I'll tell you how we're going to try to leverage this data to uh, artificially construct larger sensing matrices in a bit. Anyway, 25 receptors and maybe 100, 100 odorants. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to assume that this thing here is our rectangular sensing matrix. Remember how I said, remember how I said that you take the odor vector, you stick it over here, and then you multiply by this matrix that should give you the responses? Well, we're going to treat it like that. This is the linearized response of the receptors to 100 different odorants. And then what, what can we do? I'm just going to check here. Is it true that this sensing matrix preserves the olfactory information in a distance preserving way? Okay, so that's, that's my question. And what we're going to do is we're going to compare the real thing as measured in Drosophila with the sort of idealized random sensing matrix consisting of Gaussian random entries. And we're going to ask, compare how well these two things do to see if the overall hypothesis makes any sense. What do we see? So we linearize the sensing, assume odors of k components, and I'm going to vary k, the number of components in the odor, between you know, uh, uh, 1 and 14. And I'm going to generate the uh, responses. This L1 decoding is a jargon for the standard decoding algorithm of compressive sensing. And here's what you see. I'd like you to focus on the following two things. The green line is the responses, uh, is the reconstruction performance that you get for the actual data from Drosophila. Um, this is what you would get if you instead imagined that olfaction was a sort of more, um, uh, was a sparser code, was a more like a labeled line where each receptor really is in charge of, let's say, sensing you know, five or six odorants really well and doesn't care about anything else, that, that the animals are adapted to specific odorants, which are the ones that evoke the responses more strongly. That's this kind of picture. It basically sparsifies the and thresholds the response matrix as measured in the experiments. And so that's this line. Clearly, it does much worse in its decoding error. And this dashed line here is the best you can do with, tw with, 20, uh, with this number of receptors. Right? So as you can see, the actual measured performance, um, the, deco uh, the, 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 the decoding performance from the measured sensing matrix comes pretty close, actually, to the idealized Gaussian uh, sensor, the, the best you could do mathematically with this number of sensors. So that, that's encouraging also. Okay. So next, we'll say, okay, great. So now the next thing to do is part of my limitation here is I only have you know, 24 receptors and I only have 100, 100 uh, odors. What I really want is I want the whole 10,000 odorants if I can, you know, lots of odorants, and I want more receptors. How do you do this? So since we don't have the data, we're going to do a trick to statistically extend this matrix 
to be a big matrix, lots of odorants and lots of receptors in such a manner that it preserves various statistical properties. Specifically, it preserves the histograms, the firing rates, it preserves the covariances of the matrix. And in this way, we generate an artificial sensing matrix that hopefully captures the key statistical features of odorant receptor binding, at least for the case of Drosophila, which is what we're looking at here. And then you can repeat this analysis. So uh, this is a complicated plot, so let me break it out for you. So in the y-axis, there's a measure of distortion, which is you look at the compressed representation, namely the responses of the receptors, and you ask how much change there is in the distance between odors relative to what they were originally. This is the Euclidean distance, right? And then on the here in the first plot, I imagine olfactory systems with you know, 50 receptors, 100 receptors, 150 receptors, 250 receptors. And in this plot, I imagine 216 receptors, but with odors that are more and more complex, 50 components, 100 components, 150 components, and so on. So what you're seeing in this plot, oh, um, and then the colors here describe imaginary olfactory systems in which you threshold the responses so that uh, to decide how many of them are considered above threshold, right? So how sparse is the response matrix? Okay, is uh, uh, name, uh, that's roughly speaking thinking. Uh, another way of thinking about that is all receptors are noisy. So whatever the noise level is sets a threshold for above which you can rely on the response and below which you can't. So, okay, so we're going to allow that threshold to be different depends on this. Are, so a low threshold corresponds to um, uh, very reliable receptors and the high threshold corresponds to very unreliable receptors. So what you see is that suppose you have odors with you know about 50 components, the kind of natural kind of complexity, then by the time you get to a few hundred receptors, you've basically plateaued down and your performance in terms of representing the odors while preserving the distances is excellent. Right? Likewise, suppose I have a couple of hundred receptors, then as I keep increasing the number of components, at least to this, to this amount, right, you know, a couple of hundred components, you see the reconstruction performance or the distortion, the performance as measured by not distorting the order representation is excellent. So that's great. It suggests that indeed these principles of using kind of basic disordered sensing, you know, uh, as, in, as in slightly random sensing to, uh, to compress the high dimensional order space into a low dimensional response space may be correct. And also, perhaps this may explain a thing that's otherwise puzzling. The puzzling thing is if you go from, you know, fruit fly to the billion fold heavier African elephant, all the animals have a few hundred receptor types, give or take a small factor. Everything, right? It's kind of, kind of crazy. The elephant nose is definitely bigger than the fly antenna. And so maybe the reason is with a few hundred receptors, if this analysis, uh, uh, is, is, is pertinent with a few hundred receptors, you can certainly deal, per, you, you're not going to get any better or much better in dealing with orders of natural complexity if you had a much bigger olfactory system. So maybe this explains the, the, uh, the operating point that they all have a few hundred receptors that bind diffusely to many different orders. Okay. So having said that, we have to sort of modify this a little bit. So this is work published in eLife a couple of years ago, done with um, Tiberiu Tessilianu, who's now um, um, uh, uh, one of the members of the Flatiron Institute Neuroscience Center, and with Simona Coco and Rémi Monasson, who are my colleagues in statistical physics at the École Normale Supérieure. David, this work was actually done when, when, when I was visiting the ENS. I'm very fond of this. Ple very pleasant memories of that year. So, okay. So here's the observation that I want to fold into what we already said. Earlier, I was saying, oh, great, you know, we, we have some account of how many receptor types you should have, maybe it's a few hundred, they should bind in some diffuse manner. But if you actually look at the data that's been coming out over the large, uh, last decade, you also re realize that there's this very curious phenomenon that every month your olfactory receptor neurons die and are replaced, and it appears that you know, the proportions of the different receptor types change. So this experience dependent remodeling of the olfactory receptor neurons, right? Completely weird. And nobody knows why or how. Well, if we're going to follow the logic that we've already put on the table, then we should say that this is some kind of adaptive remodeling, but this is happening for a reason. 
okay, so let's see what that reason may be and try to see if we can provide actual evidence that it's happening for a reason. Here's the way I'm going to do it. So once again, that the logic is going to be there's a natural order distribution. And you know, previously we were talking about the orders being sparse in order space, etc. And there may be other structures too. And there is some set of receptors which have some sensing matrix. You know, there are different kinds of molecules and there's different kinds of receptors, and they respond in some way. And I want to work out what is the best distribution of receptor neurons to represent this order information. People who uh, you know, have had a long history of working in sensory systems, especially vision, will recognize this kind of logic. It goes all the way back to Horace Barlow in the 1960s, and you say, oh, well, you know, the way I'm going to figure out the logic of the early sensory system is I'm going to claim it's adapted to the statistics of the natural world, and by doing that, I should be able to work out some things, at least, at least at some gross level, about the organization. Okay. So we're going to do the whole physics thing and uh, you know, make this very crude and rough and nevertheless get something useful out. So our framework is going to be, again, following the, 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 the history and tradition in vision. We're going to suppose that the order receptor distribution is organized to maximize information in the sense of information theory and bits of information and so on, to maximize information about the order environment from the olfactory receptor response. A precedent for doing this, successful precedent, is there's a paper I wrote once with Peter Sterling, David Brainard, and, and, and Pat Garrigan on the relative abundance of red, blue, and green cones in uh, the primate eye and, uh, and arguing that it was adapted to natural image statistics. So we're trying to do a similar thing here. So we're going to make a very simple model, you know, uh, uh, clearly not reflecting all the order plumes and what have you that are floating around. But I hope you'll see there's some useful universal things that come out. So the simple model says that, well, the order and distribution is kind of Gaussian um, around some mean with some covariance matrix. Right? And this covariance may be structured so you have this sparse structure with you know, every order and has only 50 components, whatever. There's some thing. And we're going to stick with this very trivial sort of, um, well, uh, or not trivial, maybe, maybe linearized response matrix. So our response of any Neural type, neuron type or receptor type is going to be the concentration vector drawn from this distribution multiplied by a linear sensing matrix that's simply linearizing the nonlinear response around an operating point and then you add noise right because neurons are noisy now you recognize that if i had kj receptors of type j then when the signals from these receptor types from these receptor neurons are summed in the olfactory bulb you're going to beat down the noise Right? because you're summing these signals. And so the simplest model you could have of that summation beating down the noise is you divide by the square root of the number of receptor types. Right? We can discuss, is that exactly how it happens or not? But the, we're, we're trying, you, you know, this is all going to be, this is a talk about getting to the ballpark, not about really nailing it up to the coefficient. And so following the tradition of vision, we should just go ahead and maximize the mutual information between these input distributions and these output and the distribution of output responses and see what we get. And that's supposed to give us all our predictions. So let's see what to do. I repeat, once again, there's the epithelium with the odorins, their bound, their uh, molecules bind to the receptor neurons, the receptor neurons are collected in the bulb, there's some processing, and the response model is like this. Linearized sensing, oops, uh, plus some, um, uh, there's a, I think there's a typo here, plus uh, the effects of noise. So this is a calculation, right? Uh, it'll take you uh, a little while to do, but uh, straightforward enough. The answer is that the mutual information between the responses and the order and concentration distribution takes the following form. This is the mutual information. And the mutual information is one half trace of the log of the identity matrix plus a product of three matrices. Let me talk to you through those three matrices. K is a diagonal matrix of all the receptor abundances. Our goal is to fix these receptor abundances, choose them to maximize I. That's what we want to do. Sigma is a diagonal matrix with a noise variances. You can readily imagine that that's going to be important for determining how much information you get. And Q is something that I'll call the overlap matrix. So if you take C to be the covariances of the odors, then S S, C, S transpose, where S is a sensing matrix, is something like the covariance of the output of the output responses. So for those of you who are familiar with information theory, you may remember that in the standard Gaussian channel, if I have a single Gaussian channel, the mutual information between input and output is one half the log of one plus the signal to noise ratio. 
right? And the numerator is the variance of the signal, and the denominator is the variance of the noise. So this is basically like that. Sigma inverse is like the noise variance, and KQ are giving you the signal variance. So it's something like that. Anyway, we have to find KA, all these receptor abundances, to maximize the mutual information. What do you get? So this is again a calculation. And it turns out that the answer you get is such that the receptor abundance that you predict is correlated with the inverse of this overlap matrix. So the overlap matrix, once again, has something to do with the covariance of the responses. So I'm not breaking that down further because it's a little bit complicated what happens and for a certain reason. So, you know, it's very common in sensory neuroscience to say, well, you know, how should you organize your sensory system? Well, some receptors have high signal to noise ratio, so they're useful, right? The signal is much bigger than noise, and some receptors don't, so they're kind of useless. So you should keep the ones that give you lots of information because they have high signal to noise ratio and dump the others, right? That's clearly what you would do. What this is telling you is that in this problem, it's much more subtle. You're actually correlated to the inverse overlap matrix, so that's a global effect. So what can happen here is that you can have a whole bunch of weakly responsive receptors that provide you more information than one strongly responding receptor. So you may want to dump the strongly responding receptor in favor of many weakly responding receptors. It depends. It depends on what the noise is like. It depends on what the covariance and the odors is like. So it depends on all of these global factors, which to me then begins to explain why it's so difficult to understand the organization of the receptor distribution in the olfactory system. It isn't like, you know, if this is, if this responds, if it talks a lot, it's useful. That's not clear. There's a global effect going on. So let's break out what these global effects are. So here's one. So suppose you have lots of olfactory receptor neurons, right? I, I, I tell you, you are allowed to buy you know, 10 million receptor neurons, right? So if you have lots of receptor neurons, it hardly matters. Everybody's gonna have high signal to noise ratio because you can throw lots of receptors at everything. And so what basically happens is if you optimize this mutual information, you, all of them are expressed with similar proportions. By contrast, suppose I tell you you're poor, you can only buy you know, 100 receptor neurons or, or 1,000 receptor neurons. Then it turns out many of the receptor neurons that you might have in your hand or that you're capable of expressing shouldn't be expressed. And instead, and, and the ones that are expressed should be expressed in a highly skewed manner. By the way, if you look at the olfactory systems from flies, through mice, through humans, it's more like this. If you look at what actually happens in these systems, many receptor types are weakly expressed and some receptor types are very strongly expressed. So it's more like this kind of distribution. So there's a prediction here that you could, in principle, comp uh, compare with, you know, uh, across species that receptor diversity should increase with ORN population size. So I haven't really done this very carefully. You know, there was a sort of half a dozen animals that uh, I pulled out. So that's not really enough data to actually say much. Uh, and the elephant isn't here because I had, when I made this plot, I didn't have the elephant data. <laughs> anyway, so it's sort of generally true that receptor diversity increases the number of uh, olfactory sensory neurons, but you have to be a little bit careful with this because, you know, as is well known, animals also have specific niches. So if you really, really, really care about the smell of banana, maybe you should, you know, overemphasize banana. I don't know. So there's sort of niche type issues that aren't, that aren't you know, dealt with in, in translating this plot into this plot. So I wouldn't take this too seriously as, as, a, as a comparison. However, here's something that we might try to take more seriously. Imagine that I have two environments with different covariance matrices the odorants, you know, they, they occur with different kinds of frequencies. Now, if I have lots of receptor neurons so that you have high signal to noise ratio and I optimize the receptor distribution for these two environments, you wind up with similar distributions of receptors. They're, they're basically the same. But if you have low signal to noise, which by which I mean that you have you don't have that many receptors, then you see dramatic you predict if you're maximizing information, dramatic changes in the proportions of some of the receptor types between different environments. This allows us to compare qualitatively with the recent experiment. There's a beautiful experiment by, by Ibarra Soria et al, Joel Mainland's lab, um, um, in which they did the following thing. They raised mice in environments, that, uh, they were genet you know, the, the same mouse, right? So genetically identical mice, and then um, uh, uh, raised them in environments where different populations were exposed to different uh, odorants in their, in their water. So, you know, the covariance descriptions, uh, the covariance matrices were different. What they found 
is that, well, some receptors, this is RNA-seq data, so intrinsically a bit noisy, but anyway, uh, some receptors are heavily expressed, some ex uh, receptors are weakly expressed. The heavily expressed receptors don't change much between environments. The vertical axis here is the change in the receptor count between environments, between these order environments. And if you go this away, uh, this tells you that the uh, weakly expressed receptors show dramatic changes between, between, different, between uh, uh, different environments. Now, we would love to just reproduce this. If someone gave us the sensing matrix for the thousand mass receptors and all the odorants that are there in the experimental setup, we'll just do this and compare. But we don't have that. Right? The data that's available is you have 60 receptors and 100 odorants. So we did our best with that. We took the 60 receptors and the 100 odorants and sort of did a mock experiment of this kind right? um, in, in silico. And here's what you find. You find some receptors are heavily expressed, some receptors shouldn't be heavily expressed, and the ones that aren't heavily expressed change a lot more between environments than this one, than, than, than the heavily expressed receptors. So the theory clearly reproduces the qualitative structure of the experimental results. You wouldn't take it to the bank because you know, it doesn't settle anything, because you need, you need, you need more here. But I, I submit it to you as a helpful piece of preliminary evidence. The real way to check this, oh, uh, I'm going to skip that. Um, the real way to test this theory is through environmental engineering. You want to engineer correlated versus uncorrelated environments, like in the natural world. You need a complete library of receptor responses in mouse, and you need mechanisms for receptor population adaptation that, that we can talk about. So, um, David, how am I doing on time? You have six minutes. Okay, so okay. I'm going to ask, ask. I'm going to ask you to pick. If you want me to talk about the non, the non wait, I have an echo. Uh, where's the echo coming from? Uh, you know what? Maybe I'll just keep going with the talk and very quickly talk about nonlinear sensing of mixtures, and then give you a little snapshot of the final of the final ideas. So you know, to do all of this. So now clearly we're at the stage. Those two results tell you that we're at the stage that at some qualitative level, at the ballpark level, things are working. So it's time to sort of get serious. And some, some things are experimental, you need more data, and some things are theoretical. For example, one of the theoretical things that you need to get straight is sensing of olfactory molecules, um, of uh, volatile molecules is nonlinear. So that's quick to do, so let's just do it. So this picture of a matrix multiplying vector is just wrong, right? Because there's sort of complicated nonlinear effects. We need, and how can you do this? Because no, there's no way the experimentalist can deal with a combinatorial challenge of measuring responsive receptors to all the possible combinations of odorants. So what you need is a biophysically motivated model. You need to do the actual sort of physics of the thing. So I'm going to remind you, and we're going to pass through this very quickly, that this is a very well-studied subject for a century, right? You can write down, here's a receptor, there are multiple ligands, the ligands have different binding affinities, they, you know, they bind to the receptor, then the receptor transitions to an activated state, blah, 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 blah. You can read out the, you can work out the answer, you can read out the answer from a book, you know, whatever you want. And you can work out in this way, this is a competitive binding model, you can work out the predicted response of receptors for a competitive binding model of this kind. Very classical biophysics. Does it work? Hey, look at this. So you take three, this is the same receptor I was showing earlier. Here are the three dose response curves. From the dose response curves, you read out these parameters, and then you predict the responses to binary and ternary mixtures. Look at that. Works pretty nice. Well, I mean, compared to this, which is the linear model, it works very nicely. The details are sort of a little bit off, but it, look, it works really well. So you can push this. Well, real orders don't have three components. Real orders have like 50. Well, unfortunately, we don't have a single receptor with the dose response curves with for 50 components measured. So we can't quite do that. But we do have, we had one receptor with 12 odorants with responses, dose response curves to 12 odorants available. So great, we did the same thing. And what do you know, if you predict the mixture response, it's excellent as a prediction. In fact, the summation model for, performs tenfold worse. So I would submit to you that everybody trying to do olfaction, theory of olfaction, should now start using these kinds of competitive binding models as your baseline model. It's definitely you know, 10 times better than the linear model. It will even capture some other kinds of interesting nonlinearities. So for example, this overshadowing where you have two orders which both evoke responses, but if you present them together, it only responds to one of them or appears to only respond to one of them. The suppression, there are two orders that evoke responses, but somehow you present them together rather than the responses adding, you get an intermediate response. There are many effects of this kind. 
And the competitive binding model that I just described produces effects like that. And it can also be extended by there's lots of biophysical information about you know how to add facilitation, cooperativity, non-competitive inhibition. You know you take these kinds of things in every basic you know uh, course on how receptors work, and you can incorporate all of these into this model. Uh, this is very well understood, and you can produce synergy inhibition all of that. So I would like to suggest to the community that we should start doing this because we'll have a good model of the sensory periphery and can start thinking about the stuff that's deeper in the brain. Okay, so I have four minutes. So in the four minutes, I'm going to give you snapshots of results because there's clearly no time to go into go go in detail. So the snap, the next thing I want to talk about is we talked about the encoding process and about the receptor distributions and everything. The next things we want to do is to go step forward is how do you decode complex odors. So there's a combinatorial response to the receptors. What do you do to read it out? So I'm going to give you an idea of what. Uh, of a way of doing this uh, using this very simple simplified model and then i'm going to tell you it all works, even for a realistic thing with a with a, uh, a, a much more realistic scenario so here's a very simplified model right um, again it's linear sensing. And we're gonna make everything binary so odorants are either present or absent indicated by the blue dots. i'm going to imagine that my sensing matrix is also binary. In the sense that either it senses stuff or it doesn't sense stuff. Basically, I put a threshold, and below the threshold, it's not sensing, and above the threshold, it is. Right? So I'm going to imagine it's like this. Now I ask you: here is the response. These two receptors responded to this odor. How can you figure out what this odor vector was? Well, here's a way of doing it. Look, this receptor at the top didn't respond, which means that these two odorants, odorant two and four, two and four must be absent. This receptor didn't respond, so odorant three and uh, this was actually five, six, seven must be absent. So we call this estimation by elimination. Basically, silent receptors, non-responsive receptors, because of the combinatorial nature of the code, eliminate most of the possible space. And then you can simply work out what the molecules were. It's a kind of amazing thing, actually. To see if it works, you've got to check the statistics. And here you can work out using, you know, basically doing the statistics of this, you can show that it will work. And indeed, uh, so I'm not going to discuss this in detail because we don't have time. And you can show that so long as the complexity of the order is not over 30 to 50, you know, that, 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 so in, with the parameters we picked, it's about 30, you can decode with all, you know, really well just using this kind of scheme, right, from a, a binary scheme. Now you may say, well, you know, you need to get more serious. You know, you told me you'd be serious with a nonlinear response model and everything. Uh, so indeed, you can do that. You know, you can have a competitive binding model, and then you can do this estimation. But now it's something that's something a little bit tricky because the response model is nonlinear. You need to invert that that uh, that uh, the that property. Right? You need to invert this equation. I'll tell you about that in a second. Instead, I'd like to tell you that you know, if you do this plot again, where one minute, one minute. Zero minutes. One minute. So, uh, so David, I'm going to assign you to ask me about the slide at the end. You you should say, uh, tell me about the slide you left out because there's a very cool thing in it that I'd like to tell you about. Okay. So, but I'm going to tell you that if you try to rewrite this algorithm into a neural network, the implementation of the neural network really resembles the olfactory pathway in the sense that there are receptors, then you have to collect the signal, you've got to beat down the noise, and you project randomly, and then you have some sort of uh, the kind of balanced network that you have in the brain, and this will implement the decoding algorithm. Again, that's no proof of anything, but it's suggestive that, they are this, that these things work together. I'm going to stop there because I'm out of time. And I'm going to leave these experimental tests of this idea up. And if you ask me about this, I'll tell you about the other slide I missed and about this and about a behavioral test that we actually already did that seems to work out.